Do you like anime? Do you? FromSoft certainly thought you did with the introduction of weapon arts in Dark Souls 3. To be honest, some of these are so damn anime, I'm surprised your character doesn't shout out the name of their move over a dynamic freeze frame before performing it. But, can you beat Dark Souls 3 using weapon arts only? Let me explain the rules of this run. I could only use weapon arts to attack anything. You know, those special attacks that swallow up your blue juice and look more anime than a 600 year old character who inexplicably looks like a teenager. Simple, right? Probably, which is why I also made a second rule. I could kill normal enemies with whatever weapon I wanted, but I had to kill every boss with a different weapon each time. Slightly less simple. No damaging consumables, no parries, no backstabs, and no summoning. I could respec at Rosaria, but I could only do it three times, as there are only three lootable pale tongues available in-game, and I didn't plan on going online. This shouldn't be too bad. Right? Oh god, honey, no. <sighs> I don't know why I wrote that last part, because that was a goddamn lie, and I knew it. This run can go and choke on a barrel of pickled pig penis. <laughs> so far, my to-do list read, Remind Gundir just who the F I am. Kill big things. So many big things. Grab every available lootable weapon and upgrade material. Level up enough to be able to use a wide variety of weapons, as well as having enough attunement and HP. That means some sacrifices need to be made. Goodbye Vitality, my old friend. We'll meet again. Don't spend any boss souls that can be transposed into weapons. I said don't! Cry into your lukewarm coffee as you wonder why you do this to yourself. Win? I fired up the game, gave myself the cleverest name ever, made myself suitably hot to match, chose the hidden blessing as my gift, and tried to decide what class to start as. Let's do this. For now, my only priority was beating Gundir. I dismissed Cleric and Thief immediately, as neither starter weapon has a skill that actually causes damage. I also discounted Warrior, Pyro, and Deprived, as the weapons for these all use Warcry. Warcry does change your R2 attacks, but one application of the weapon art can last several attacks, so this kind of feels like cheating. The Mercenary's Twin Blade Spin Slash might be fast and cheap, but it's also utter garbage. Knight and Herald have solid weapon art options, but they are both expensive relative to the amount of attunement you start with, which left me with a choice between Assassin or Sorcerer. Both classes start with a weapon with the Shield Splitter skill. The major difference being that Sorcerer has more attunement, so the choice seemed obvious. Time for a magic playthrough, guys! Uh oh. I ran past everything that was, um, run pastable, stopping only to grab the Titanite, approached Gondir and said, Wake up, honey, it's time for your daily humiliation. Poked him until he grew a giant boil from the stress and lanced it till it popped. Good thing I picked Hidden Blessing as my starter gift. I looted everything from around Firelink, placed the coiled sword, touched the darkness inside the firekeeper. She asked me to, I swear, officer and I was ready to go. With Gundir dead, the world was now my oyster. Well, the high wall was at least. I did the run around to grab every available item, bought my bus ticket from Emma, yeeted myself off a tree first try like the pro that I am, traded some bombs for shards with the creepy crow, and tried to decide what weapon to decimate the big ice doggo with. My first choice was the Lucerne, with its weapon art, the Twirly Whirly. So, I plus wand it, and returned to show Vort who was boss. Apparently, Vort was the boss. You've heard of spin to win, right? Well, this was a case of spin to lose, because this weapon art is absolute hot smoking trash. After a couple of awful attempts, I decided to rethink my strats and switch to the old reliable broadsword, with its weapon art, the pretentious pose. Hold a stance, and follow up with R1 or R2 for a unique attack. The difference was like night and day. With some careful Estus conservation, I was able to cut Vort's sizeable backside into icy ribbons, after which I redeemed my bus ticket and returned to Firelink to level up. With Vort dead, the world was now my even bigger oyster, but for real this time. I breezed through the undead settlement, 
grabbed all the useful goodies, walked in and out of the Great Woods boss room to despawn Hodrick, ran through to the Road of Sacrifices, met this absolute lad, helped him to cut a fire demon down to size, and looted the hidden area making especially sure to grab the Pale Tongue here. I figured that before moving on, I should try and take out old Tree Balls himself to get access to the transposing kiln. And I hadn't given up on the Lucerne yet, so in an attempt to redeem it, I infused it with a fire gem. Well, guess what? It still sucks. In fact, it actually sucks even harder now. Yeah, fuck that. I'll be back later. Undeterred by my tree failure, I pushed on through the crucifixion woods to be grunted at by Horace, grabbed all the shards in the area as well as the stamina shield, made Hazel and the two NPCs kill themselves in despair at my mastery of ladders, sprinted through the swamp to extinguish all the beacons, collected the upgrade materials from the old wolf's bonfire area, headed back to Highwall and performed a magic trick to make Grey Rat disappear, and returned to Firelink. My next weapon of choice was the spear, with its weapon art runny pokey. I bought one from Grey Rat, plus three that bad boy, tested it out on Swordmaster, and headed back to the Undead Settlement for Tree Balls Round 2. If I thought that this time round would be easier, I was sorely mistaken. Not only does the animation for the weapon art take about five years to wind up, leaving you wide open for counter hits, but it also misses the ball sacks far more often than it actually connects with them. I'm not embarrassed to say I spent around 45 minutes trying to burst his bubbles without any great success. Well, I am a bit embarrassed. I didn't want to waste my spear now it was upgraded, so I decided to test it out on the Crystal Sage instead. And it was at roughly this point in the run that I realised exactly what I'd got myself into. You see, the issue with most weapon arts is that they lock you into their animation for far longer than normal hits, while still leaving you vulnerable for the majority of that time, meaning getting counter hit is a very real problem. Damaging the Sage in Phase 1 was no real issue except for the stupid purple homing crystals that can hit you from behind when you least expect it. Phase 2, however, was a massive clusterfuck. Using the spear to take out the clones was far too time consuming, and ignoring the clones to focus on Sage meant certain death. After several fails, I decided to re-strategize and equip a second weapon, in this case the Cellsword Twin Blades. Sure, their weapon art does crap damage, but that's irrelevant when it comes to taking out the clones quickly as they all have 1 HP. With the clones dead, I could then switch back to the spear for Sage himself. This was a good idea in principle, however the Spin Slash had an annoying habit of completely missing the clones despite standing right in front of them, so this was also a rip. I did have one more trick up my sleeve however. I went to Farron Keep and let the Dark Wraiths gift me some souls, and then chatted up the Handmaiden to obtain a Compound Bow. The Compound Bow's weapon art is the Speedy Legolas, which lets you fire off an arrow extremely quickly, perfect for dealing with the clones efficiently. Finally, after almost an hour and a half of trial and error, I was able to burn the sage like a spiritual healer and move on with my pathetic life. With my well-earned souls, I bought a bastard sword from Grey Rat for later use, upgraded the Exiled Greatsword to plus one, ran up to the cathedral taking out the NPCs on the way, Ignored stupid sexy Gale thrusting his butt at me. Surprise, motherfucker! Collected all the tits, and finally found a good use for my fire lucerne. I knew you wouldn't let me down, old friend. It goes without saying that Sigurd is the broest of bros, and I didn't want to spend 15k buying his armor, so I poked and prodded patches to death, unlocked Rosaria's bonfire, and spared Onion Man the indignity of having to climb out of the well completely naked. Nobody needs to see that. I would be back to finish the Deacons later, but for now I had a big pukey tree to de-ball. Round 3, and this time I used the Exile Greatsword with its weapon art. The blades on the sword go round and round. A bit of fire paper and a lot of spins later, and the mighty tree was finally felled. I gave Shaldi the transposing kiln, and it was time for my first Lords of Cinder, the Abyss Watchers. My weapon of choice for this fight was the Irithyll Straight Sword, which I obtained by poking the Boreal Knight to death from the safety of a doorway. One reason why I picked this weapon is that it upgrades with Twinkling Titanite, meaning I didn't have to use up any more normal shards. Main reason though is it looks fucking dope. 
Remember how the broadsword's weapon art was stance? Well, this is the cooler stance. Get it? Because it's a frost sword? Okay, look, you wanted anime, here's your goddamn anime. Phase 1 was mostly running around letting old red eyes do the donkey work while getting some sly hits in. Phase 2, however, was where the hidden weeb in me got really moist. My main strat here was to bait out the leaping slam attack and punish. Sadly, the fight was over too fast as always, I pocketed my rewards, and finally it felt like I was making some good progress. I ran through the catacombs ignoring pretty much everything, headed down the broken bridge to loot all the large shards and chunks from smouldering lake, sat down for a brief rest to watch the big worm that definitely isn't Solaire getting harpooned, went back to Firelink to buy a halberd and upgrade it to plus two, and returned to the cathedral to slap some priests for crimes against humanity. I had a definite plan for this one. The halberd's weapon attack is the ah RUN! And the advantage of this is that I could use it to push the deacon away from the main pack during the fight, in theory making this simpler. What makes this one a little tough is that this is essentially a DPS race, and if you don't finish the fight fast enough you'll die from curse. After a couple of failed attempts, I decided I needed to up my damage more, so I let the Dark Wraiths do some more farming on my behalf, and up the Halberd to plus three. Finally, I had enough damage output to be able to finish the fight quickly enough. I used skulls to distract the pack in phase 2, pushed the Archdeacon away from all the carnage, and charged him to death until all his church fuckboys collapsed. With my hard earned souls, I upgraded the Bastard Sword to plus five, and it was time to face old Smokey Joe himself, High Lord Walnair. The Bastard Sword's weapon art is the Chad Pose. Similar to Stance, pressing L2 allows you to follow up with a heavy attack for a big sweeping uppercut. Walnir tried to piss on my parade by summoning his skelly bros, and then promptly ruined it by killing them all himself. Good job, dude. I smashed his old festival wristbands into dust, waved goodbye to the big lad, and returned to Firelink to level up some more. After taking out the angry pooch on the bridge easily enough with fire paper and the bastard sword, it was time for more running. So I Usain bolted past everything in Irithyll, grabbing all the materials on the way, stopped off to let Siegvard feed me soup while I gazed lovingly into his onion helmet, ran past everything in the dungeon equally quickly, making sure to get the key for Siegvard's cell, proceeded onwards to the profane capital, and freed my boy for a titanite slab and the covetous gold serpent ring. Look, I know I say no summoning, but I'm not counting this. Firstly, there's no way I'm not doing Siegvard's quest because he is the bestest boy, and secondly, since the Storm Ruler's weapon art makes Yorm a complete joke anyway, having Siegward in the fight makes no real difference to the difficulty. I watched the emotional cutscene, we took turns summoning the power of the wind to carve up the giant, uh, giant, and I pocketed my easiest reward of the run. Well, the easiest so far. If Yorm had lulled me into a sense of false security, then Pontiff was waiting to slap that shit right back out of me. My choice of weapon for this fight was the Astora Greatsword, with its weapon art, the Running Shish Kebab. My logic for choosing this was that I figured it was one of the highest damaging attacks for me at this stage, so I plus 7 it, levelled myself some more, and went to face off against Sully. This fight is easy. All you have to do is parry his leaping- Oh, wait, no, look, I can't do that. Okay, how do you dodge this guy again? And why does he have infinite stamina? The greatsword does do good damage, but you will leave yourself open for counter hits. After a couple of attempts to figure out where my viable attack openings were, I managed to charge the old boy and his transparent friend into an early grave, after which I opened up an Orlando and looted everything not bolted to the floor, stopped to say hi to Yorshka because, um, reasons? and returned to Firelink for a sit down and a cup of warm cocoa. Did someone say anime weapon arts? Well, I give you the Great Sword of Judgment, transposed from Pontiff's soul, and its weapon art, purple flying shit. Hold L2 to assume a stance, and follow with a strong attack to launch a wave of dark magic at enemies. Perfect for taking out the dancer, and I don't mean on a date. 
I had enough Titanite scale to plus two this bad boy before I returned to the high wall to face my first challenge. Killing Emma. This wasn't as easy as I thought it would be, but still turned out to be far easier than the dancer herself. As mentioned before, one of the main issues with this run is how long you lock yourself into animations every time you attack. This, combined with Dancer's ability to respond to being hit with an instant stun lock combo, as well as her impossible reach in a boss arena that, let's be honest, is a little bit too small for her, all added up to many, many frustrating deaths. I won't detail them all here, suffice to say, after nearly two hours of trying, I finally got sick of her shit and clutched it with no flasks left to blow her stupid head off. I needed a break after all that hard work, so I went and fought the giant crystal lizards in the cathedral and in Farron Keep for more titanite scales. Also, I figured the footage would look pretty cool, and it does. Next, I returned to the dancers arena, made myself a lovely warming bowl of neck blood soup which I promptly got cock blocked from enjoying by a falling ladder, and ran through the consumed king's garden to grab the chunks and scales on offer here. As it was a Thursday evening, it was time to take out the trash. So I progressed through Lothric Castle removing all the grunts, collected every available upgrade material, of which there were plenty, slayed a mighty dragon with a foot infection, and also made sure to grab the Knight's Ring which adds an extra 5 points of strength. This would prove to be extremely useful, as I had stopped levelling strength at 22, so the extra 5 points would enable me to two-hand weapons that require 40 strength. I still had one more Lord of Cinder to dispatch before I could progress, in the form of Aldrich, Devourer of Gods and Spammer of Arrows, who was busy chilling in Anorlondo while treating Gwyndolin like an absolute snack. Aldrich is extremely weak to fire, so using a fire weapon art was a no-brainer here. My weapon of choice was the Gargoyle Flamehammer, so I returned to the profane capital and farmed one from, yes, you guessed it, the Gargoyles. The Flamehammer's weapon art is the, ooh mama, that's hot. Anchor the hammer on the ground and shoot out a burst of flame. I leveled it up to plus eight using some of the resources I'd grabbed in the castle and went back to Anorlondo for some slug hunting. I can't believe I've never used this thing before, because it's a beast. The weapon art absolutely destroys Aldrich, and this turned out to be one of the least challenging fights of the run. After my stunning victory, Emma transported me back to the dancers arena, despite being already dead, and it was time for me to celebrate. I knew Osiris could be a stumbling block, mainly because of how fast and skittish he is and I had no real concrete ideas on how to kill him, so I backed up my save and did some experimenting. Here are the results of my findings. The Twin Axes, Bag of Shite. The Great Lance, Bag of Shite. I guess that meant it was time to let Old Man Gale seduce me by offering me his used comrade. I got zoomed away to Ariandel, where the enemies all gave me the cold shoulder, and I grabbed a bunch of weapons for the next stage of my journey. The Follower's Sabre, the Follower's Javelin, the Quakestone Hammer, and the Crow Talons. First up, the Sabre with its weapon art, the Swooshy Blade. This is one of the fastest weapon arts, and one of the ones with the shortest animations, so it would be perfect for Parent of the Year, Osiris. I made it plus eight, infused it with a refined gem, and returned to the Consumed King's Garden to stand in the boss's smelly crotch to shred it to pieces while occasionally dodging his spin and stomp attacks. Champ time next, and I knew that, due to his hyper aggressiveness in the second phase of the fight, getting some distance between me and him would be essential. So my next weapon of choice was the Follower's Javelin with its weapon art, yeet! This one is pretty straightforward. You just throw big pointy things at people. This turned out to be a great call. A plus eight javelin does a decent amount of damage to the big lad. And as long as I maintained my spacing and didn't get comboed into the ground by him, victory was in the bag. Push, call yourself a champ, champ. Time for some R&R. 
I filled my pockets up with blueberries, bought the priestess ring, transposed Gondir's soul into the prisoner's chain, as I figured this would be more useful than his weapon for the rest of my run, went back to Irithil dungeon and prayed to the gods to take me to a better place. Unfortunately, they sent me to Archdragon Peak instead. Confession time. There was no way I wasn't going to plunge attack the Wyvern. He's hardly even a boss anyway. Best I can do is activate in Perseverance just before plunging. Don't like it? Tough. With the wannabe boss deaded, I backtracked to collect every upgrade material in the area, of which there are a lot, and headed onwards to the Belfry where Havel not Havel decided he would have pancakes for breakfast. The one who shall not be named could wait for now. So instead, I backtracked to Lothric Castle to face the Dragon Slayer armor. I was short on ideas for this section, so I backed my save up just to be on the safe side and tried plan number one. The Dancer's Swords. Yeah, I know. I mean, look, I knew these things were crap, but I didn't realize quite how crap they actually are. I reloaded my save and resorted to plan number two. The Wolf Knight's Greatsword, transposed from the soul of the Abyss Watchers. Its weapon art, Gym Class Superstar, lets you perform a forward flip and smash with the sword, which should be perfect for Dragon Slayer. I leveled it up to plus three, and it was time to somersault Butterfly Boy to death. This one was also pretty simple. Dragon Slayer is weak to this weapon, and I could do some pretty big damage while still having enough time to react and dodge away after. Easy clap, GG me, etc. With the archives now unlocked, I could loot the area for goodies. And what goodies there are indeed. Chunks, slabs, twinkling, scales, ester shards, undead bone shards, you name them, we got them here at Lorian's Emporium, where our friendly store assistants will be positively gushing to help you. Why not take a break and enjoy the stunning vistas of our rooftop gardens, where you can enjoy the delights of the hunter's ring or test your stamina on the never-ending staircase of death. It's fun for all the family. Speaking of family, I had a pesky pair of incestuous brothers to dispose of. I knew that this would be another fight where I would need a fast weapon art to succeed, since Lorium barely pauses in between combos. So, I went back to Smouldering Lake to kill the fire demon for its soul, which I transposed to make the demon's fists, with their weapon art. Carolina Reaper Hands. Spin to win, and strong attack to slam down a pillar of flame. In order to maximise their potential, I decided to use my first respec. So I travelled to the not so amazing chest ahead lady Rosaria and transferred all the points I had originally put into decks across to Intum Faith. Lorian and Lothric were none too impressed by me intruding on their bedroom antics, so it was time to fight. My only real strat for this battle was to attempt to out damage the brothers. There was a place to stand in Lorian's armpit where I could sometimes get away with a full attack combo without getting counter hit. But this wasn't foolproof by any means, so I just made sure I had decent armour on and tanked the inevitable blows where they came. For phase 2, it was imperative that I managed to hit Lorian in his human backpack as much as possible in order to keep the length of the overall fight down, and after a few failed attempts that I can definitely blame on terrible RNG and not on myself, the brothers met their fiery doom. I returned to Firelink, placed all the cinders on their thrones which caused Ludlith to spontaneously combust, unlocked the kiln of the first flame bonfire, and headed onwards to the Dreg Heap. I collected all the items from the Dreg Heap, spoke to definitely not Patches, killed a few angels like a true demon should, grabbed some useful rings, and most importantly picked up the Aquamarine Dagger. Now, I might have been bumbling through this run with no real coherent strategy thus far, but I had a definite plan to take out Nameless, which had been in the back of my mind all along. For this, I would use a duo of weapons. Firstly, I transposed the Dragon Slayer's Great Axe and plus 3 it. Its weapon art, Bigu Shocker, would be perfect for taking out Nameless's giant chicken quickly and efficiently. For phase 2, I would switch to the Aquamarine Dagger. His weapon art, Wannabe Lightsaber instantly converts your blade to a magic sword, unlocking a different set of attacks while held. Phase 1 went as smoothly as expected, with Big Bird going down in just a few big lightning summons. Phase 2, on the other hand, was a hell of a grind. 
This phase of the fight took around 20 minutes to complete, and essentially involved me baiting out Nameless's flying thrust attack, as this was the only one which guaranteed me a totally safe window at the end of it to be able to retaliate and dodge away. Here, have a highlights reel, I can't be bothered to write anymore. I was done with magic weapons for now, so I used my second respec to revert back to my original stats, and it was time to take on the Demon Prince. It was also time to revert back to my lack of any coherent strategy. My first thought for this fight was to use the Black Knight Greatsword. Black Knight weapons do extra damage to this boss, so this should work well, right? Well, actually, no. The Greatsword has the same stomp weapon art as the Bastard Sword, with the small difference that you could start it up, go and make a nice cup of tea, wash the dishes, mow the lawn, and rearrange your Funko Pops collection in colour order, before returning to watch your character finally finish winding up the attack. It goes without saying that this didn't actually work too well, so not for the first time I needed a plan B. This came in the form of the Chaos Blade, available at the side of the Dark Fire Link Shrine. Most katanas in the game, including this one, have the Weeb Pose weapon art. Holding the stance and following up with a light attack performs a fast slash from the sheath position. I plus five did up and returned to wreak my revenge on the demons. The main tactic here was patience. I needed to conserve as much Estus as possible in phase one, so I made sure to carefully pick my attack windows, only fighting the fire demon while making sure not to get caught in a toxic relationship with his sibling. After carefully picking them both off, it was time for the daddy demon himself. Fortunately, I know this phase of the fight better than I know the front page of Pornhub, and on a good day, I can hit with it. This wasn't a good day, but it was good enough, and with the prince slain, I could rest on my laurels and travel to the Ring City itself. Now you might say that I run things in the Ring City, and by this, I just mean I run past things in the Ring City. I avoided the archers, spoke to the goth poet insect dude, said hello to Medea, speared Alva, avoided the Herald Knights, sprinted through the swamp, waited for Medea to barbecue the bridge, took him out with the Dragon Slayer Great Axe like a champ, and then gave the same treatment to the Ring Knight with the paired greatswords. Half light time, more like big cheese time, am I right? I returned to the halfway fortress to farm the Corvian Sorcerer for a Storyteller's Staff. The drop rate for this isn't fantastic, but I got lucky and obtained it on my second run. No need to level this weapon up. The Storyteller Staff's weapon art, COVID-19, emits a poisonous cloud which isn't affected by the weapon level. Wanna see something cool? Enter the boss arena and go and stand behind the last pillar on the left. Wait for the Painted Guardian to spawn in and totally ignore you, and once Half-Light himself appears, spam the weapon art until he does his funky little dance of death and succumbs to poison with the minimum of effort. Too easy. This next test is very dangerous. To help you remain tranquil in the face of almost certain death, smooth jazz will be deployed in three, two, one. Yeah, I'd been putting Sister Frieda off, and what? Look, don't judge me. My weapon of choice for this fight was the Quakestone Hammer and its weapon art, Earthquake Slam. Look, I couldn't think of a funny name, all right? Slam the hammer down and flip it back up to cause a small AOE. I plus tend it, Spoke to Daddy Anal, who was enjoying a large mug of cappuccino in peace, waited for Feats McGee to put in an appearance, and then got to work. The hammer worked perfectly in phase one. All I had to do was bait out her invisibility and smash her as she charged up her scythe attack. Nice. Papa A was so upset, he threw his coffee everywhere. Things caught on fire for no reason, and it was time for phase two. The hammer wasn't so great here, as the wind-up for the weapon art is slow, 
and I was constantly running the risk of being counter hit or caught by Frida's frost attacks. So I needed a second option. Luckily, I had the perfect thing in my bag. The Ring Knight Straight Sword. The weapon art for this sword is the Fiery Whoosh Whoosh. Set your sword on fire and follow up with a set of fast slashes by pressing R1. This made Phase 2 much easier to negotiate and I made it safely through to Phase 3, which is where the fun began. I could only reliably punish two of Frida's moves in this phase without fear of retaliation. The one where she charges towards you for a grab attack and the end portion of her invisibility attacks. Phase 3 took over 9 minutes to finish off, but it was worth it just for how goddamn anime the whole thing was. Look! I was into the final stretch of this run, and my next obstacle was Bad Santa himself. So I went to visit Filianor and stroked her egg, which somehow caused the end of the world, which was nice. Oh well, I guess I should explore. In the only place left in existence, I found Gale enjoying a nice snack of pygmy, and it was time to take him on. My weapon of choice here was the Hollow Slayer Greatsword, with the old reliable weapon art, Stance. This weapon, does additional damage to Gale in phases 2 and 3, so would be perfect. I ran around collecting all the remaining Titanite scales I'd missed, as well as spending all the souls I had on some more, plus 5 the sword, and faced off with the creepy uncle. For phase 1, I only punished his leaping attack and his flying thrust. Most other things were too risky. Once he was done burping up blood and looking badass, it was on to phases 2 and 3, when my strat was fairly similar dodge most things and punish his leaping attacks as they have a longer cooldown at the end. Lightning flashed, my sword slashed, Gale flew around like a man possessed and I hacked him to death at the ends of the earth. Very epic indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you a montage I like to call Medea is my bitch. Take it away. There was only one obstacle to overcome now before finishing things off, so I transposed the frayed blade from Medea's soul went back to Rosaria to respect one final time and move all my points into decks, gave the Firekeeper the blueberries as she was looking a little pale, and headed off to the kiln of the first flame to take on the soul of Cinder. The Frayed Blade's weapon art, Ultimate Weeb Pose, would work perfectly here. Not only could I transition from my stance into a flurry of attacks with the blade, which also caused bleed buildup, but I could also perform a ranged attack, which was useful when I didn't want to get too close. Curved sword phase, I'm looking at you here and judging silently. With phase one successfully negotiated, it was time for phase two and plim plim plon time. Or at least it would have been if I didn't have the music muted. Oh well, I guess I can always add it back in during the edit phase. You know, like this. See? Cindy died an honorable death I briefly considered linking the flame before summoning my fire waifu instead to get down and dirty with her and usher in a new age of darkness. We held hands as the flame faded. Well, at least we did in my own headcanon. The end credits rolled and I had beaten Dark Souls 3 with weapon arts only. 
I couldn't help thinking I'd missed someone, though. Oh, okay, fine. Are you happy now? What do you mean I'd forgotten someone else? Oh, yeah, fuck that guy in particular. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe if you haven't yet. And I will catch you all next time. Peace.